What if we could understand the origin of the universe? What if we could improve lives by controlling atomic structures? What if we could truly grasp the complexities of the human brain? The story behind the Coverley Prize started in the 1930s with a curious boy named Fred growing up among the tall mountains of Eresfjord in Norway. A deep curiosity about nature and the universe stayed with Fred throughout his studies in physics and his entrepreneurial success in the United States, until he eventually established a philanthropic foundation with the vision of advancing science for the benefit of humanity. One of the first activities of this foundation led to the inauguration of the Kavli Prizes. The prizes are awarded every two years in a partnership between the Kavli Foundation the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters and the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. The Kavli Prize laureates are selected by the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters based on recommendations from prize committees from six of the world's most renowned science societies and academies in the three scientific fields. Astrophysics, nanoscience and neuroscience. The biggest, the smallest, and the most complex. The Kavli Prize continues to be driven by the same sense of awe and curiosity felt by Fred Kavli as he grew up in the midst of nature at its most sublime, experiencing the vastness of the universe. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Eric Isaacs, president of the Carnegie Institution for Science, and we're really delighted to have you join us for the Capital Science Evening. We're in particular honored to be partnering with the Kavli Foundation, the Norwegian Embassy in the US, and the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters uh, to feature this Kavli Prize Laureate uh, and in general the series. Before we start, I just want to acknowledge uh, Cynthia Friend, uh, president of the Kavli Foundation, who's with us today, and Turlev Opnand, deputy chief of mission for the Norwegian Embassy. So today's program is a um, conversation between Professor Andy Fabian, who received the 2020 Kavli Prize in Astrophysics, and Emmy Award-winning journalist Frank Cessno. Professor Fabian is at the University of Cambridge's Institute for Astronomy, uh, where he leads the X-ray research group. Fabian has made major contributions in both observational astronomy and theoretical astrophysics. And his research spans a broader range of subjects, but his probably his greatest acclaim, and we hear about today, is his use of X-ray astronomy to understand some of the most energetic phenomena in the universe that include quasars, blazars, but importantly, supermassive black holes that reside at the centers of our galaxies. The idea is that the, the movement of materials around these massive black holes, uh, largely it's the gas surrounding these black holes, produce copious amounts of high energy X-rays, which are, when observed, important for understanding these massive objects and, and their evolution. He's also known for his investigations of hot gases that surround giant elliptical galaxies that inhabit galactic clusters. And the interesting thing here is that these, these, uh, these um, hot gases are too hot to form stars, even after billions of years, the age of large fraction of the universe so that the existence of this gas has, has been revealed only by observing these X-rays, which they produce in, this, in these very hot and extreme environments. So Professor Fabian is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and served as its president between 2008 and 2010, um, as well as 29 years as a member of the editorial board for the society's uh, prestigious monthly notices journal. He, reserved, he, he received a Bachelor of Science in Physics from King's College London and earned a PhD from the University College London. Uh, his thesis work involved designing instruments and that enabled him to measure diffuse radiation from behind our Milky Way galaxy called the X-ray background. He's been at Cambridge uh, since 1973 where he has held several posts including Vice Master of Darwin, Darwin College, Royal Society, Research Professor of Astronomy and the Director of the Institute of Astronomy. 
Uh, in 2006, he was awarded the Order of the British Empire. He's also a recipient of the American Astronomical Society's Bruno Rossi Prize and, a, and the Joint American Institute of Physics and American Astronomical Society's Donnie Hyman Prize for Astrophysics. And of course, as we've already said, he is the 2020 Cavalier Prize Laureate in Astrophysics. So this event will be structured almost entirely as a conversation between Professor Fabian and Frank Sesno. Frank is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. And prior to this position, he was the school's director for 11 years and also spent 20 years at CNN where he served as the White House correspondent where many of you may have seen or heard of him before, anchor and Washington bureau chief. I must say that it's always a pleasure to have Frank moderate these events. Uh, his perspicacity as an interviewer of great scientists always reveals new insights about science to our audience, as well as insights, importantly, into the person behind the science. So I know this is gonna be a fascinating conversation featuring Professor Fabian's personal journal, Journey of Discovery, and his breakthroughs. So please join me in welcoming Andy and Frank. Frank? wonderful to be with you again today and be with this tremendous audience that we've got and Professor Fabian or should I call you Sir Andrew order of the British Empire or how shall we refer to you in our conversation here oh I think you're are you muted are you muted I cannot hear you I'm not muted sorry uh, no please call me Andy <laughs> all right I will I will hey, do that. Well, Andy Welcome. It is just a, a, a delight and a privilege and a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, before we dive in uh, to our supermassive black holes and other things here, where are we seeing you uh, right now? Where are you coming to us from? I'm in our house in Cambridge, England, uh, and it's beginning to go dark. Uh, the sun sets in five minutes. All right. Well, we'll we'll track that too. And as I say, and as Eric indicated to the audience. Andy Fabian here is one of the world's leading uh, X-ray astronomers. And in our conversation here, we're going to do several things. We'll talk about his astronomy and supermassive black holes and what they do and uh, the function that they serve, uh, where this all came from and his own remarkable personal and scientific journey. And we want to engage you, the audience, along the way. We'll ask you a few questions uh, about uh, some of the, the conversation here and uh, spin off of that. And we want to take your questions at the end of this. So we'll do, we'll do a lot and we'll make this a real conversation. So Andy, should we begin? Please, yes. Okay. Why don't we talk, uh, begin by asking the audience a question and see what the audience knows or thinks about black holes. So I'm going to invite you uh, with your screens to see the poll that we're putting up now. And please feel free to answer. From what we know, a black hole is a vast empty space devoid of matter and energy. You can click there. A space-time continuum that reveals the chronology of the universe. Feel free to click that one if you think that's right. A place of such extreme gravitational pull that light cannot get out. Click there if you think that's the response. A tunnel uh, in space or of space that enables intergalactic movement. So please feel free to click on that. And then in just a moment, we've got uh, lots of people here. We want to put up the results again. Vast empty space devoid of matter and energy. Space-time continuum. Place of extreme gravitational pull that won't let the light out. Or a tunnel that enables intergalactic movement. And uh, when you're ready, uh, who's managing our polls, our producer here, please put up the answer. Um, as we get ready to see that, though, Andy, your interest in black holes started when? Well, probably when I was a graduate student um, around 1970. So uh, black holes were just starting to become hot. Okay, so here's we've got, here's what we've got. Um, not so many people think it's a vast space devoid of matter. 99.4% say it's a place of such extreme gravitational pull that light can cannot get out. How did how did how did our audience do? It was a fantastic result. Yes, they. <laughs> They know about black holes. <laughs> um, and in, in, a, in a sentence for the very small people who do not, how do you describe what a black hole is, you know, to someone on the street when you come across them or if they say, I've never even heard of this before? What, what is it? What's the, do you, do you have a, a, a very short uh, kind of brief description of, of, of what it is? 
I'll try. It's uh, when you have a mass which is in such a small volume, uh, its gravitational pull is very large, and it becomes, as it gets smaller and smaller, the pull is larger and larger, and uh, basically space-time wraps itself up, and we can't actually see the thing inside, and uh, basically it's, in a sense, separated from our universe. That's what a black hole is. And, and, and you have been looking at these black holes, studying them in their many dimensions for a very, a very long time. But um, I'd like to start with, with where this came from. We said, said we would make this conversation some about you, some about your science. Let's start with you, uh, Andy, because you've had an incredible career, incredible contribution to our understanding of black holes and X-ray astronomy and, and all the rest. Um, and actually, let's put up a, a slide, a beautiful sky, an, an image uh, of, of the night sky. You yep. were interested in this very early in your life. Tell us about that. I first got interested in astronomy uh, when I was, I think, six or seven. And I was looking at a sort of encyclopedia book. I can still remember the page. And it had pictures of stars of different colors and the like. And uh, it basically said, these have certain temperatures and are made of certain things. And I found it incredible that people could actually um, work out what something you can't possibly touch uh, could be made of. So I was hooked. And you found yourself, I'm fascinated by this too, um, sort of grinding your own telescope, your own mirror at a very early age. Well, I, I was a teenager and um, I decided to make a reflecting telescope um, and uh, you just get a, two pieces of glass and you rub them together and uh, it, one of them gets a, a face like that and the other one is the opposite and they sort of come together. You have to put some carborundum powder in between and, I, and water and you keep grinding and you have to keep on uh, adjusting it to get the right shape. And um, the book I was following said it, you, after three hours of grinding, this is with the roughest with the carborundum powder, it, it, you'll end up getting the right sort of shape. And it took me about 30 hours to get to this. <laughs> so I, I, it was, anyway, I, I, I managed. <laughs> you, you managed and you clearly demonstrated your attention span early on. Were your parents pushing you into this? Are they the ones who inspired you to, to, to pursue your, your interest in the heavens? Or was this just all from within? Um, yeah, my father was, there was, it was a non-scientific environment. And so it was entirely me. And um, yes, yeah, so I, I, they didn't stop me, but uh, I just, uh, yeah, I was self-propelled, shall we say. <laughs> well, and it was your PhD uh, pursuit that really launched you in this field. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because that's what gets us into the um the X-ray astronomy and, and and where we're going with our conversation here on supermassive black holes. Yeah, I, I decided I wanted to become uh, a, an astronomer, um, but um, I did what I do think is sensible. I did a physics degree, and uh, there wasn't any astronomy in my physics degree. But at the end of it, I I, I thought actually I wanted to do space astronomy, so I managed to get uh, go and work at a space research lab. And um, my PhD involved looking, at, as was mentioned earlier, at the X-ray background. This is a radiation, X-radiation coming from all over the sky. Now, to, to observe X-rays, you need to be up in space because X-rays are easily absorbed by air. They, it, those kind of X-rays I look at can only travel about that far through air. Um, X-rays are absorbed, and that's why we use them for medicine because X-rays are absorbed by they can penetrate uh, skin and bone, but they also are absorbed by the bone, so, which is why the X-rays we're familiar with, medical X-rays. But um, you have to be above the atmosphere, so therefore you need to be have a satellite or rockets. And back then we used what, what are known as sounding rockets. They're, they're rockets. My rocket was maybe 30 feet long, um, and there are instruments at the top where my detector was, and it's launched and it goes up. Um, maybe a, about a hundred miles before it falls back down again, and we end up end up getting about fifteen minutes exposure to the sky, uh, to the night sky um, above an altitude of uh, about uh, seventy miles. 
And uh, so that's what I was doing. I had two rocket flights during my uh, PhD, one of which was from a place called Woomera in Australia. And uh, then the other one went from Sardinia into the Mediterranean. I know you have some slides and let me give you an opportunity to put some of those up and start to walk us through or fly us through uh, <laughs> what, what you were seeing and what you were learning as you uh, really developed your science and, and your expertise on, on black holes. Yeah. So uh, let's start by, uh, we're looking at the night sky picture here. And what we can see is uh, those who are familiar with the night sky will recognize Orion. But uh, Orion is, is the constellation in the middle. And uh, that's Orion's belt I've pointed to, the three stars there. There's the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, I'm pointing to. And up here, we've got the moon. And so that's what the night sky looks like, uh, will be familiar, even if you don't know your constellations, you're, you're familiar with that kind of view. And most of the things you can see there are, in fact, all the things you can see there, apart from the moon, are, of course, stars. And their stars are within our own galaxy. Now let's right. go on to the next slide, which shows the same patch of sky, and this is being done by computer, same patch of sky uh, viewed with an X-ray telescope from an orbiting satellite. And what we can see now is this is uh, the, the Orion's belt. Can you see the three stars there in Orion's belt? There's an arrow they pointing are, to that. Exactly. They are X-ray bright because they're young stars. There's star formation happening in Orion, and there's strong magnetic fields and things. This down here, the orange one, is Sirius. Yeah. Can we go back? That this one. Can you go? Uh, okay. Let's go forward one. Oh dear. There's one in between. <laughs> oh dear. One we were just on, right? Yeah, that's right. So let's go. Um, hopefully, this will work now. There we are. This one down here is Sirius. But I want to point out that this is not the star we see, which is Sirius A. This is Sirius B which is a companion to Sirius A, is a binary system. And this is a collapsed star, which is a, known as a white dwarf, where everything is collapsed down, to, it's just like the sun, collapsed down to the size of the Earth, and that's a white dwarf. This thing up here is the moon, which is an incredibly feeble X-ray source, because it's just, basically, things are not easy to reflect with X-rays, and mm -hmm. X-rays don't reflect very well. So. That's just reflection of the moon. This bright thing here, up here, is known as the Crab Nebula, is the remnants of an exploded star, a star that exploded in 1054. A massive star ended its life then. And uh, the brightest bit of it is a pulsar. It's a dead star the size of a city. It's only about 10 miles across, and it's spinning rapidly 30 times a second. So if you could imagine taking Washington, and spinning it around 10 times a second. then I, I, you, I live here. I sort of feel like that's happening most days, but that's OK. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, but that's it, it's giving it a size. Uh, but it, it's, it's still got the mass of the sun uh, right. when it's there. And it's highly magnetized. So and, and actually, most of these dots out here are distant black holes, black holes at the centers of galaxies. And I'll take you on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. which is just a deep image, not, this is looking at a little patch of sky with an X-ray telescope called XMM, and virtually all the dots are black holes at the centers of galaxies, and there are fuzzy objects, which I'm just pointing out. Could you maybe see a fuzzy object here and here? Those fuzzy objects are clusters of galaxies. We'll talk about them later, but that's just showing you there are, there are black holes everywhere. And uh, most uh, are there, is a black hole at I'm the center. Sorry, are, are there, and, and I know you want to talk about the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Correct. What, can, what do we know about that? Well, let's, let's then move on to our galaxy. And here is a, a, an optical picture in the, in the visible band uh, taken with a, uh, just a, a long lens and so forth. I didn't do it. But it's a lovely picture of the center of our galaxy in the constellation of Sagittarius. 
and and all this diffuse stuff is is we call it the Milky Way. If you go somewhere where it's very dark <laughs> and that you've got very clear sky, then you could usually see this band across the sky, the Milky Way. That's our galaxy. We live in this flattened galaxy, a uh, spiral galaxy it is, and looking at the centre, we can see uh, all this, uh, lots of stars, and in fact, all this dark stuff. And the dark stuff is dust. It's stuff which is not dissimilar from what's under your bed. Uh, or, you know, if you're a smoker, what you blow out, um, it's that kind of dust. And as you know, if you go in a smoky room, uh, fortunately, we don't have them very, very often anymore, but uh, you can see it, it, the dust obscures your view. And all of this dust along the line of sight obscures the view of the center of the galaxy. But everything in our galaxy rotates at about 220 kilometers per second around something that's roughly around the center where I'm pointing here. And uh, then if we go and look with a telescope which can see through the dust, if you look in infrared light, you can start to see through the dust and then look at the stars right at the center. And what's seen there in this montage of pictures taken by uh, people in Germany and in Los Angeles, um, with their telescopes, that montage is roughly each time this is looping in the middle is is about 15 years, okay? But we can see that the stars in the middle are moving very rapidly around something where the arrow is pointing here. And the stars out here are not. And those stars near the center, one of them goes up to 5,000 kilometers per second. All the rest here are very, very slow, just like we are, 200 kilometers per second. And so it's going around something, and that something, there's a radio source there, an X-ray source, but you can't see it in the infrared like that. And basically, um, it, it, that is the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Of our galaxy, that's what we're seeing, wow. Yeah, so this is, and it's known as Sagittarius A star, because it's in the constellation of Sagittarius, and A star, that's the name given to the, the radio source there. And that's identically, uh, that's, that's just where the uh, black hole is. And if we move on again, we can see these two images. And this one was published just a couple of weeks ago. This is Sagittarius A star, an image made by a, a large team of people, hundreds of people across the globe who've used telescopes across the globe um, to look at Sagittarius A star, the telescope in, in, in Chile, telescope in the South Pole, telescopes in Hawaii and so forth, all coupled together. And they're able to actually image this and uh, see this ring. And the black hole is at the center of this ring. And Sagittarius A star uh, it is, uh, or the black hole that's at the center here, has a mass that is four million times the mass of our sun. Four million, Four million times, the times the mass of the sun. Yes, yes. And I'll call it the celery mass. Pardon? <laughs> yes, we, I, this is four, solar, four million solar masses, okay? A couple of years, uh, three years ago, they also published one in a bigger galaxy, and it's, it's about 2,000 times further away than the center of our galaxy, but black hole is 2,000 times more massive. And you notice, therefore, it's got a ring which is almost exactly the same size. And this is showing something about black holes, and that is they, they all look the same apart from their mass. The mass makes them bigger or smaller, but black holes, in the words of Stephen Hawking, don't have any hair. They don't have any structure. They only have mass and one other property, spin, which we need not talk about at this moment. But it's remarkable now, how similar the images are. It's incredible. Uh, now, your <laughs> research has provided evidence that supermassive black holes at the heart of galaxies are really sort of the engines that, that drive the flow of hot gas out of the galaxy, yes. right? They're influential. Can you talk about that and what's, what's happening here and what influence does that have? Sure. L let's go. The, the next two slides are going to talk about that. This is looking at 3C273, which 3C, C stands for Cambridge. It's the 
273rd object in the third Cambridge catalogue of radio sources, being pedantic, but um, when it's looked at in the optical, and here we're looking at it with Hubble Space Telescope, you can see this bright object. This is a star in our galaxy. This is probably, um, this is a million times further away than that star. And because of the inverse square law, this means it's a trillion times brighter than that star. So this is like a trillion times the luminosity of a star, okay? A trillion times. That's one followed by 12 zeros. It's incredibly luminous. This is the first quasar that was observed, and it took 10 years before it was realized it was really accretion onto a black hole. That accretion is matter falling into a black hole, and it doesn't just fall straight in. It, 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 it can't, I mean, it, it's going to have some sort of angular momentum, we call it. It's got some rotation to it. And here's a picture of how it, an artist's impression of how it might be swirling in down to the black hole. And because it's going down very close to this black hole, it's the speed of the swirling goes up to half the speed of light. And uh, there's a lot of energy released. And the amount of energy released from accretion onto a black hole is, is almost um, close to all of the rest mass energy. That's just for the being technical about it. But just to give you an analogy, the amount of energy per kilogram that's released from accretion, if I compare it with, say, petrol in a car, petrol's got chemical energy, and that's what causes your car to go forward. And let's imagine your car can do 30 miles per gallon, and it doesn't matter whose gallon it is, but 30 miles per gallon. This means it, if, if you could tap accretion onto a black hole in your car, you'll be able to go 30 billion miles per gallon. That's a factor of a billion, OK? I mean, that, that would solve all energy problems, except yeah. Yeah, there aren't any now. black holes. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I, I Andy, don't... Yeah. You, you, you spent a lot of your career and, and your science as, as you look at this and, 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 and contemplate all this, researching how this energy is generated. Yeah. But, but can you tell us about that? Like, where, what do we know, what do you know about the energy that's being generated in these engines of these galaxies? Yeah, by looking at the x-rays that come uh, from the, the, the accreting material and also this bright source above it shines on the material and produces uh, emission from that, all combined together enables us to deduce what the geometry of this is, even though we can't possibly take a picture of it. We can actually cause in, could take a picture of this, but this is an artist's impression. Uh, in terms of these luminous things like 3C273, they're much too far away for this event horizon telescope that took those other pictures to actually be able to take a picture of this. And therefore, we have to use other indirect techniques, uh, which is where the X-rays come in. And the enormous amount of luminosity here is enough to uh, blow stuff away as well. There's a balance here. You've got material accretes into the black hole. There's gravity pulled in, but the radiation comes out, and that pushes everything out. And so we end up with a balance. And um, that can take us on to this picture, where we've got the comet. Which brings us to our next polling question, which invites the audience to look at this picture and then answer, answer a question, which will take us to the next part of this conversation. And the question is very simple. The tail of a comet is, pick one, made of gas and particles from the stars it passes. The tail of a comet corresponds to the speed at which the comet is traveling. The tail of a comet always points away from the sun. The tail of a comet smells like rotten eggs. So we'll, we'll, we'll let people choose. While they're doing that, uh, Andy, let's go, when we can, when you tell us about that picture, we'll hold the slide up of the answers here while people respond. But that picture we were just looking at, where does that come from? 
would that was a out. comic that was a comic called hail bop i do remember when i was nine seeing comet aaron roland and and that was a pretty bright comet too but comet hail bop was in 1997 and maybe many of the audience will remember seeing it in the sky because it was probably the brightest comet that's been around for quite some time. Hmm. Let's take a look at the answers from the audience and see what people think the tale of a comet is all about. So 15 or so, uh, close to 16% say it's made of particles from the stars. Uh, about 9% say it corresponds to the speed at which the comet is traveling. 74% say it points away from the sun. And we got one and a half percent who say it smells like rotten eggs. So who's <laughs> right, Andy? <laughs> Always points away from the sun is the correct answer there. <laughs> Do we know what it Com smells like? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably there is some hydrogen sulfide somewhere in there. <laughs> so that question might not be completely wrong. But, and, what uh, is basically, the, and how does that correspond then to, to, to black holes? Andy? How does this inform? Well, what I, this is just to show you the effect of if you have intense radiation, and you're, you've got comets are as that there's they're dirty snowballs essentially, um, and so it's frozen ices and dust in, embedded in it. Uh, as they evaporate, as they come near the sun, or probably sublimate as they come near the sun, uh, then all the dust that's released gets blown away by solar radiation. Radiation from the sun exerts a pressure, a small pressure, which we don't. You can do experiments to show it's there but generally you don't notice it. But that pressure pushes the dust tail away and it will always point away from the sun. There's also another tail which is made of ionized gas and that is called the iron tail, that's the blue one. And so and this is, happens to be M31, the Andromeda galaxy by coincidence, the sun is up somewhere over to the left. And so all I wanted to say is if you have a lot of radiation, it's pushing, pushing uh, the dusty gas away and that's what causes some dramatic things within galaxies. Andy we have a ton of questions from the audience and we're going to get to them in a little bit but one <laughs> I want to bring in right now because it seems so relevant actually several people are asking this which is where does the material go after it's drawn in to, to the black hole's gravity? Uh -huh. Well interestingly um, the black holes, I talked about right at the beginning, that space-time gets wrapped up, okay? This is both space and time. And if I was to throw a clock into a black hole, as it falls in, it would get redder and redder, but at the same time, the clock would appear to stop working. It would be, appear to be frozen um, as it just vanished from sight. And basically, all the material that's fallen into the black hole, as far as we from the outside are concerned, it hasn't actually yet got right to the center of the black hole. But if you were to fall in with it, you would certainly fall in and uh, basically um, until you uh, undergo what's known as spaghettification. Uh, the enormous tidal forces will cause your feet to accelerate away from your head. And spaghettification is when you get stretched. <laughs> That's a technical scientific term, I assume. <laughs> so, so yes. in this, in this in, uh, Andy, and, and I know you have a couple of slides to show this in this sort of cauldron of energy that, that we're talking about yeah. here. This, you know, where you've got energy going and 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 disappearing. Does it cool down? And these bubbles that come out. What are they all about? What's happening in these huge galaxies where this is taking place? Okay, let's go on to those. Um, this is uh, just a little movie showing a spiral galaxy with uh, an outflow um, here where it could well be triggered and pushed out by radiation from- well, What are we, a, what's coming out? What, are you, what, what do so, we see so, here, Andy? It's a spiral galaxy here. Oh. And uh, these are dusty rings in it. And we're going towards the center where there's a supermassive black hole. And the radiation is pushing the gas out at the center. And these sparkly things out here are stars that are formed in the outflow. So that is just one 
indication of the sort of dramatic kind of thing you get. And this is what happens, that the outflow is actually changing the shape of the galaxy. But let's go on to the most massive galaxies in the universe. And an example here, galaxies like to cluster together. And we're now looking at the part of the Perseus cluster of galaxies, which is in the constellation of Perseus. Surprise, surprise. And these yellow things are big elliptical galaxies. There's a sort of spirally galaxy down there. And this thing, which looks like a spider that somebody's trodden on in the middle, um, this is a, a very interesting galaxy. It's my favorite galaxy in the sky. It's called NGC 1275. And it's the big, biggest galaxy in this cluster, and it's right at the center. Let's now look at what it looks like in X-rays. And there it is. Uh, it's, we're looking at it in X-rays. And uh, this is an image of the same scale as the previous one. So we're looking at this enormous set of structures. And what we see here are this sort of ear-shaped thing here. There's a bubble here and a bubble there. And these bubbles are buoyant in this hot gas that's here. And there are bubbles here and here. And so, so, so what are we seeing? So what are we seeing in the actually happening here? What you have, what's happening? It's the, the black hole. Yeah, there's a black hole at the center. Let's go on again to just the X-ray image here. The black hole at the center here is is has got jets of material squirt out above and below. They blow bubbles in all of this stuff, which is the hot gas trapped in the cluster, and they become buoyant and rise up, and that's one of the bubbles there and there. So all of this structure is caused by the black hole at the center. And I want to make the point that the size, physical size of a black hole at the center is a billion times smaller than the size of this structure that it's made. Okay. And it's rather like having something like, you know, a small orange, something the size of a small orange controlling something the size of the Earth. Okay. Now, the difference in mass. Is 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 not a billion, but uh, that that's the way in which we call it AGN feedback, just to give it its name, or supermassive black hole feedback, where the energy generated by the black hole is actually controlling, in fact, the amount of gas, the amount of star formation that takes place in a galaxy, and can even rearrange it. So it turns out this is. 30 years ago, people started to realize there was a black hole in every galaxy. And initially, it was thought that this was like a sort of bauble at the center of every galaxy. But it's no ornament. It's what controls the evolution of the galaxy. That's, and, and there are some audience questions that I want to just bring in here because they're so relevant to what you're speaking about right now. Um, sure. One, one person asked, is a black hole necessary for a galaxy to form? That's a very interesting question. We don't actually know. We don't know whether the black hole forms first or the galaxy forms first, you know, the, the stars and everything. What we do know is that galaxies, they form within regions in where there's something called dark matter that we've not talked about, <laughs> forms a clump. Within the dark right. matter, there's gas falls in and we think that the black holes are formed from gas that's been accreted onto a black hole that may have come from a star, or it may have come from something bigger than a star. We're not sure. This is, these are the sort of questions right at the forefront as to which came first. So here's a, here's a sort of a bookend question to this, as I, as I think of it. Another great question from the audience, which is, is there an end of life for a black hole, or does it just continue to accrete forever? If it's gas around it, the kind of black holes we're looking at, they will accrete forever. Uh, just for the aficionado to say that black holes, if you've got a very, 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 very small black hole, if its mass is less than the mass of a mountain, then it will have evaporated by a process that Stephen Hawking devised. But basically, the black holes we're talking about here are completely immune to that. 
and they'll just it could well be that in many billions and billions and billions of years all that's left of the universe are, are, are black holes and dead stars neutron stars and white dwarfs it's a few years out there but i hope that's not where we're headed um so <laughs> andy a couple of questions here and and, and then we have another thing we want to turn to the audience with in 2020 the nobel prize winners uh roger penrose and German Reinhardt, uh, Enzel, and, and Andrea Gates, in, in, in assigning the or in pro, in awarding the Nobel Prize, the committee heralded their work and said black holes are one of the most exotic uh, objects in the universe, and they still pose many questions that beg for answers and motivate future research. So I want to ask yeah. you, what are the questions that you think are central to that? future research what's and what do you okay. find in the field now that's related to that that's particularly exciting i think the, the question about what came first the black hole or the galaxy is is uh, very exciting um we see very massive black holes at um, great distances when the universe was relatively young uh, there's a question about how did they form how did they build so rapidly because we think they build through accretion through this process of matter falling into them. Um, th there are lots of many questions which I'm involved in is how does this feedback process really work? I mean, I've waved my hand and said, you know, radiation pressure and winds come out and so forth. But uh, how does it actually work is uh, still a, a very much hotly debated. Um, th there are questions, very fundamental questions about physics about the nature of space and time and information connected with black holes that I will not go into. But uh, if you're a mathematician, you can find lots of exciting things to tackle with black holes. Uh, as I said, there are a ton of questions from the audience now. I want to thank you for, for the questions. They're great. Let's see if we can get to as many of them as quickly as we can. And then I want to ask you about the question you're most frequently asked. But first, We'll go to, to the audience questions. So one that's uh, very interesting is, um, you know, we've talked about what you see through your telescopes and what you were grinding away as, as, a, as a teenager. But how about the James Webb uh, telescope? What, if anything, we're asked, will that teach us about black holes? I, I think it's going to be very interesting. It, it, it's going to be looking at the center of our galaxy. I'll be very interested myself in seeing what they see there. Um, the, the James Webb Space Telescope is operating in the infrared. Um, that means it's going to be looking at distant objects because the universe expands. As you look back in time, you can actually the things shift to the red. Um, and so it may show us the earliest galaxies, the earliest quasars, and, and, and all of that. So, Are you excited um, about that? you think this is going to be... Revelatory? Really? Absolutely. Um, I'd love to look at the center of this object uh, that we're looking at on the screen. Uh, I really would. Um, but in a way, what I'm hoping the JWST will show is, is actually uh, something that we've not thought about. <laughs> That's the most exciting thing in science, is actually finding something completely new. Um, of course, many people are excited by the prospect of exoplanets. Uh, you know, planets elsewhere. So that's uh, another issue that's going to be very strong with JWST. Um, here's one that may not be conducive to a short answer, but it's a great question. Uh, can you talk about the Hawking uh, radiation and the holographic principle? <laughs> well, I, I, I think briefly about Hawking radiation, and, and, and that is uh, basically black holes will will fall, as I said, if, if they have a mass, if they started out with a mass of a, a mountain at the beginning of the universe, um, then they will have evaporated by Hawking radiation. And uh, basically, it's connected with the uh, extremely strong gravitational field. And those, if, if people know that a vacuum is full of virtual particles, <laughs> there are little tiny particles come into existence and disappear. And what can happen is one of the members of the two, one particle can fall in the black hole, which then frees the other particle to go off 
and and uh, zip out. And uh, in that way, um, basically, the black hole re reduces in mass in that way. I won't. I can't go any further into that. And I, I'd rather not go into <laughs> the the other side of that. Uh, okay. Here's another question then from the audience. What is the temperature? Core of a black hole is it near, near absolute zero, no no molecular motion, or is it extremely high? Well, the material falling into the black hole is extremely hot, but you can you can give a temperature to a black hole. This is something that Hawking and Bekenstein back in the seventies realized, and you can do you can give a temperature to a black hole, and basically. Uh, the temperature of the black hole is, if you could imagine equating uh, radiation to a temperature so that uh, blue is hot and red is cold, okay, uh, and has a longer wavelength. Now, if you think about radiation with the wavelength that is the same size as the black hole, then that's roughly the kind of radiation that will come out. So if it radiates like that, so that's that's how one can just think about the temperature of a black hole. What it means is that the supermassive black holes, like in this object here, where it's like a billion times the mass of the sun, which has a, a the, the, the um, event horizon, that's the size of the black hole, is, is the size of our solar system, <laughs> then it has an extremely low temperature. And the amount of Hawking radiation that comes out in a Hubble time that barely mates, it barely is equivalent to one UV photon. So <laughs> some of these things are quite far out, as it were. Andy, several people have asked whether a galaxy can have more than one black hole. They certainly can. Um, sorry, uh, I put a timer on. <laughs> They can have more than one black hole. Indeed, our galaxy has got lots of black holes of stellar mass, and we know there are lots of stellar mass black holes around. We can see them in X-rays, and they can also we can also see them through gravitational radiation. Um, in terms of black, two black holes or big black holes in one galaxy, galaxies do, in their lifetimes, merge. The Andromeda galaxy, our nearest galaxy, is coming towards us at 400 kilometers per second. And mm -hmm. in uh, 5 billion years' time, it's going to interact with our galaxy. It has a black hole of 100 million solar masses, and we've got one of 4 million solar masses. Those black holes will find each other and merge sometime in maybe 10 billion years' time. And uh, then there will be an even bigger black hole. So, yes, they do merge, they do come together. Gregory asked several questions here, and I want to bring two of them together. Uh, one is, does space-time flow into a black hole? And <laughs> is it space that becomes distorted or space-time that's distorted? It's space-time that is distorted, and I wouldn't call it flowing into the black hole. Um, you know, we can flow in, but <laughs> but it doesn't. Um, and, and what about, um, uh, here's one, how long does it take for a black hole to evaporate? Quotes, <laughs> air quotes. Uh, yeah, it, talking it, it, yeah it, it is basically, it depends upon its um, mass, and you need a very small black hole for it to evaporate in the age of our universe. That's 14 billion years. Um, if it's less massive than the mass of a mountain, say, if you ha could have a black hole, the mass of a human, it, it would have evaporated very quickly. But I would say we know of no way within astrophysics of making black holes that are small. Okay? It is quite possible that small black holes formed during the Big Bang. Okay? And they are called primordial black holes. So far, nobody has discovered one. It is possible that they explain dark matter because they've got the right properties. They have gravity, but no electromagnetic interaction. Um, but uh, basically, I would just say at the moment, we, we don't know what dark matter is. We don't know if primordial make 
black holes exist in the universe. What we do know, are there are lots of black holes which are in the universe. They all have masses bigger than three times the mass of our sun. And those black holes we can study and they do have enormous influence on the universe, on galaxies and where they are. Uh, Andy, Roberto asked if one could see what's on the other side of a black hole. Uh, I, I don't, yeah, you can't look into the middle of a black hole. You could go around the other side um, and look at what's there. Uh, and indeed, um, because of the warping of space-time, uh, you can sort of see around the other side of a black hole. Okay, so th those images I showed you before, you know, that that that, that look like rings. Uh, the, the, most of the radiation doesn't actually come from a ring just like that. Some of it comes from behind the black hole. All right. Let me combine two questions here. One from Stephen. One from Richard. Stephen asks: Do do star clusters also have black holes at their centers? Richard asks, although light cannot escape a black hole, is there light within a black hole? <laughs> Great questions. Uh, the first question about star clusters, I mean, th there's still a big debate as to whether globular clusters, those are, they make, some of them have a million stars all within a region similar to the distance between us and our nearest star. Those are very compact regions, uh, uh, cl clumps of stars. Um, that we would expect black holes in them. So far, I would say we have no real fantastic evidence for them. There are hints, but nobody's yet proven there's one there. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other question was, um, sorry, Light can you remind me? On the other side. Yeah, uh, we, we, yeah, we can't see light that's gone into the black hole. Um, you know, the, basically it, it, it's all shrouded from us because space, if, if you think of it as space-time is completely wrapped up, so we can't actually see into it. And, and um, it, as I say, it's not the space, but also time is sort of wrapped up around it. Um, here's one. Uh, what is the smallest mass black hole that can exist? And how did Coulomb's law affect its particle repulsion? Yeah. The smallest black hole, there's... In physics, there's no reason why there can't be black holes of all masses. But as I said, the, the smallest ones must have been created in the Big Bang. They, we don't know how to create them now. And um, the, the ones that are smaller than the mass of a mountain will have evaporated. Hmm. So that, that's where we are in terms of the inventory of black holes. But in principle, it, you know, you could have a black hole the mass of a proton. But um, and I, I would say that, that there are some parts of physics where people argue that um, you know if you if, if you've got a big enough accelerator you can generate black holes and so forth, provided you've got other dimensions uh, <laughs> to play with um, rather than the four dimensions we're used to. And there was a you might remember there was a scare when they sort of among some people, when they turned the Large Hadron Collider on at CERN, that maybe they would, um, you know, make a black hole. But <laughs> uh, it didn't happen, and nor did, was it expected to happen. Um, we're almost out of time. I want to ask you one more uh, question from the audience, and then I want to ask you about the question you most often get. Uh, last question <laughs> from the audience here, and again, thanks to everybody for your questions. I uh, tried to get to as many as possible here, but uh, there were 70 of them. Uh, Kevin asked, do wormholes exist? And if so, are they related to black holes? <laughs> well, wormholes are, yeah, in a sense, if you, it, mathematically, it looks like if you were to fall into a black hole, if you could survive in the middle, it may be possible to form a wormhole, but it would be to another universe. Now, I think observation. I, I'm an observer, and observationally, there's no other. There's no evidence for other universes, but uh, wormholes are a possibility. But the one thing to worry about with a wormhole, if you wanted to go in it yourself, is for a start, wormholes. You have a problem in keeping them open, and the other thing is, if you fall into the black hole, 
then so does all the radiation in the universe. And uh, basically, it turns into gamma rays, and you will be fried. <laughs> I see Eric has rejoined us. Before I turn it back yeah. over to Eric, uh, Andy, I want to ask you this one last question. Um, when, when you received your Kavli Prize, uh, you, were, you were cited for your pioneering research and persistence in pursuing the mystery of how black holes influence their surrounding galaxies uh, on both large and small scales. And we've heard a lot about that in, in conversation with you today. But I just want to ask you um, what this Kavli Prize and the recognition that you've received throughout your life um, has meant for you and, and, and how that propels your work. Well, it, it, in a sense, it validates my research, my way of doing research, uh, which, by the way, you know, many, many people and collaborators and so forth are involved. You can't, you know, telescopes involve large teams and everything. So um, I, I'm just a small cog in the whole thing. Um, but it, it's uh, also meant a lot to me. I, I, I've started reflecting on earlier work and actually it stimulated me to you know the last paper i wrote and submitted a couple of weeks ago is going back 20 years and realizing something i, I could continue to work on which is quite um i find very interesting i won't describe it because uh, but it's it's fun yeah well andy i i, I want to thank you for all you've done and for sharing your your, your you know your science and your discovery with us here today and um and, and and let me turn things back over to eric but um uh, again thank you for being with us congratulations on all the recognition that you've received over your uh, distinguished career and for the contributions you've made to our understanding of of supermassive black holes in the in, in the universe thank you thank you yeah thank you frank <laughs> let me add my nice. thanks to you frank for uh, as always a great great discussion great interview and and Andy, for your great work, it was really uh, really well done. I think everybody in the audience was on the edge of their seats. And you can often tell how excited people are by the kinds of questions they're asking. And I think we got a lot of really good questions. And this whole thing has been really well attended. So thanks again. Really, really appreciate you joining us uh, from your home in, in Cambridge.